by the spring of 1944, Hitler's forces were stretched to their limit. All along the Eastern Front, there was a desperate need for reinforcements. The problem for the German High Command was where to place the few resources it had to maximum advantage. German intelligence reports suggested the next big Red Army offensive would be into Poland. But Hitler disagreed. He was convinced Stalin would strike south and seize the Romanian oil fields. Both were wrong, at least to begin with. In the early summer, the Red Army Command finally turned its attention to Finland. Russian troops attacked across the Karelian Isthmus. After two days fighting, the Finns were forced to retreat. Slowly, over the next month, the Red Army advanced north into Finland. By August 1944, it was all over, and the Finns sued for peace. It was now that Stalin showed the first signs of a pattern that would be repeated across Europe. He seized land, in this case areas of Finnish Karelia and the nickel-rich Petsamo region. Next, Stalin's attention turned to Central Europe. In the summer of 1944, he launched what he called Operation Bagration, named after a Russian hero of the Napoleonic Wars. At 5 a.m. on June the 22nd, three years to the day after Hitler's invasion of the Soviet Union, the guns of the Red Army began a ferocious bombardment of German forces in what today is Belarus. It was exactly where, months earlier, German intelligence reports had suggested a Soviet attack would come. But because Hitler had ignored them, the area was poorly defended. It was another of his mistakes. The Germans were now being pounded along a 350-mile front. In some places, the Russians used over 400 guns for every mile. The barrage was followed, as always, by a torrent of Soviet tanks and infantry crashing into the German defences. To make matters worse for the Germans, they had almost no air support. Much of the Luftwaffe was still tied up defending the German homeland. It was now that Hitler's folly of fighting a war on two fronts became all too apparent. The Red Air Force could operate almost unopposed. 
Russian planes struck deep behind German lines, cutting communications and harassing reinforcements. Within 36 hours, the German panzers had been swept aside. About 50,000 men faced encirclement in the German-held town of Vitebsk. Hitler, as had become routine, initially refused to let it retreat. Then, when on the following day he relented, it was too late for many of his troops. Four days later, Vitebsk fell. 20,000 Axis troops were killed and 10,000 taken prisoner. Further south, along the Belarus front, the pattern was repeated. Hitler, now furious, sacked his general, Field Marshal Ernst Busch. Once again, he brought in his favorite, the now promoted Field Marshal Walter Mödel. But it made no difference. Town after town fell. The regional capital of Minsk was now within reach. Two days later, the Red Army encircled it. Over a hundred thousand German troops were trapped. Soviet forces bombarded. Within a week, the German survivors surrendered. The unstoppable Russian advance now pushed on to the Baltic states. First of all was the Lithuanian capital of Vilnius. Across the entire Eastern Front, the Germans were in retreat. But they left behind them towns and countryside laid waste. They committed widespread atrocities against local inhabitants. Nothing, however, could have prepared the Red Army for what it was about to discover. On July the 23rd, 1944, Soviet forces reached the small Polish village of Majdanek, near Lublin. Here they came across their first evidence of Hitler's final solution, the Majdanek extermination camp. It was a camp designed for the murder of Jews on an industrial scale. But as the first Soviet reports of what they'd found leaked out, the Western Allies simply dismissed them. Three days after seizing Majdanek, the Russians were approaching Warsaw. But here the Red Army paused. Stalin now stood ready to do what Hitler had done before. Grab land, not in the name of Lebensraum, but of communism. By the summer of 1944, Operation Bagration had ripped the heart out of the German army in the east. <laughs> 
more than 300,000 Axis soldiers had died. One hundred and fifty thousand had been taken prisoner. The Red Army now paused and dug in along the river Vistula south of Warsaw. Stalin was in no hurry to bring the war to an end. With Europe in turmoil, conditions were ideal for the spread of communism. The first victims of Stalin's political calculations were the Poles. On August the 1st, 1944, the Polish Home Army rose up in Warsaw against its Nazi occupiers. But it desperately needed help. The Red Army, camped just to the south, was perfectly placed to provide it. But Stalin regarded the Polish Home Army as close to the Polish government in exile in London and hostile to communism. So he turned a blind eye to the plight of the Polish fighters. They were crushed with terrible brutality. The Germans wouldn't finally be pushed out of Poland until the Russian army drove them out in January 1945. It was the start of a Soviet master plan that would eventually see communist governments across most of Eastern Europe. To the north, contingents of the Red Army continued to clear the Germans out of the Baltic states. These would later be incorporated into the Soviet Union. Near the Latvian capital of Riga, over 200,000 Germans were trapped behind Russian lines. But Hitler, still determined to hold on to his Lebensraum, refused to countenance a retreat. Even so, Gradually, the German forces were pushed back to the Baltic coast. By mid-October 1944, the Germans had been squeezed onto the Kurland Peninsula, west of Riga. They would remain marooned there for the rest of the war, when they eventually surrendered to Soviet forces. Stalin, meanwhile, was already sizing up other territory in Eastern Europe. He could have moved directly west towards Germany. Instead, units of the Red Army moved south in a vast thrust down through the Balkans. Nearly 1,500 tanks and a million men pushed into Romania in late August 1944. The defending Axis forces had less than 400 tanks and just 800,000 troops. Pro-German Romanian troops gave way almost immediately all along the front. 
Three days later, large pockets of German troops were surrounded near Kishinev. Hitler issued his standard command, no retreat. For nine days, there was bitter fighting. Over 180,000 German troops were killed or taken prisoner. The remainder beat a belated retreat. In late August, Romania's pro-German dictator, Marshal Ion Antonescu, was arrested. Romania surrendered. By the end of the month, the Red Army was in Bucharest and had occupied the strategically important Romanian oil fields. It meant Germany had lost its main supply of oil. Three Soviet armies now moved south into Bulgaria. Bulgaria had tried to stay neutral, but it too would soon be swallowed up by the Soviet Empire. Meanwhile, the rest of the Russian forces now moved west towards Yugoslavia. German troops to the south, in Greece, faced being trapped. They began a hasty retreat up through Albania and southern Yugoslavia. They were harried all the way by Albanian and Yugoslav partisans. By mid-October 1944, the Red Army had reached the Yugoslav capital of Belgrade. Only now did it begin to swing north and west towards Hungary and then Germany. German reinforcements poured into Hungary to support the pro-Nazi puppet government. But the Red Army ground off. Eight weeks later, it laid siege to Budapest. The siege lasted over six weeks before the German puppet government collapsed. By the end of 1944, most of Eastern Europe lay in Stalin's grasp. His troops controlled the Baltic states and Poland, Romania and Bulgaria. Pro-Soviet forces ruled in Yugoslavia and Albania. Hungary and Czechoslovakia were in his sights. Stalin had successfully laid the foundations for the future Soviet bloc. He could now, at last, move on to Germany. But in the West, Allied forces were also approaching the German border. The race was on to be the first to take Berlin. During World War II, the skies held many dangers. Death and destruction could come with no warning 
when a German V-2 rocket plunged to Earth. The Japanese Ocha Cherry Blossom was a rocket-powered missile guided to its target by human hands. Japanese suicide aircraft, the kamikazes, were among the most terrifying weapons of the Pacific War. But there was another Japanese weapon which presented a threat to mainland America. Balloons, loaded with bombs which rode the jet stream across the Pacific to deliver their deadly cargoes from Alaska to Mexico. The Japanese balloon bombers were, perhaps, the strangest secret weapon of the Second World War. On the morning of the 18th of April, 1942, nearly six months after the outbreak of the war in the Pacific, an American naval task force was steaming towards Japan. In heavy seas, the carrier Hornet launched 16 U.S. Army Air Force B-25 bombers. Their main target was Tokyo. The American bombers caused little damage to the Japanese capital, but the psychological effect of the raid was immense. One of its byproducts was the acceleration of plans for one of the most extraordinary campaigns of the war. The first transoceanic automatic balloon offensive in history. The Americans had demonstrated that the Japanese home islands were vulnerable to long-range attack. The Japanese decided to launch a retaliatory offensive at even longer range. Balloons had played a role in warfare since June 1794, when a Montgolfier-designed balloon was used by the French for observation purposes at the Battle of Fleurou. Balloons were used as eyes in the sky in the American Civil War. When the Prussian army laid siege to Paris in 1871, balloons provided the French with a way into and out of the beleaguered city. In the First World War, tethered observation balloons swung back and forth over the opposing trench systems. They were an inviting target for fighter aircraft. The observers were provided with parachutes, while balloon busting became the province of specialists. In the same conflict, German airships, dubbed Zeppelins after their inventor, Count Ferdinand Zeppelin, launched the first sustained strategic bombing offensive against targets in the United Kingdom. For all their size, the massive Zeppelins proved fragile weapons of war. But the British exploited airships' range as maritime patrol aircraft. In the post-war years, the airship was replaced by the aeroplane as a long-range weapon. Even so, in the summer of 1939, shortly before the outbreak of World War II, the Germans used one of their airships to reconnoiter the chain of radar stations strung out along Britain's south coast. And by 1943, the Americans, now embroiled in the conflict, were successfully using their own airships to patrol over the vital Atlantic convoys. Their targets were the lurking wolf packs of German U-boats. But it was left to the Japanese to exploit the idea of the unmanned balloon as an offensive weapon. On the 7th of December 1941, in one of the opening blows in the Pacific War, the Japanese had demonstrated the destructive power of carrier-borne aircraft. After a 2,500-mile voyage from Japanese home waters, the carriers of the Imperial Fleet launched their level and torpedo bombers and their fighter escorts on the 250-mile flight to Pearl Harbor the Hawaiian base of the U.S. Pacific Fleet. The Japanese achieved complete surprise. 
Seven American battleships were sunk or disabled. Hundreds of aircraft were destroyed on the ground. Despite this, the Japanese were aware that direct attacks against the US mainland were all but impossible. Pearl Harbor lay in the middle of the vastness of the Pacific Ocean. The tyranny of distance placed America beyond the range of Japanese bombers. The great cities of the United States were untouched by the ravages of war, which had already overtaken the cities of Europe and were about to engulf the Far East. In the eight-month blitz on London and Britain's major cities and ports, some 40,000 civilians had been killed and over a million homes destroyed. The Japanese decided to develop balloons, which would cross the Pacific to drop incendiary and fragmentation bombs on American farms, forests, and cities. They calculated that to an American public shaken by Pearl Harbor, but accustomed to think itself invulnerable to enemy attack, the effect would be devastating. In the first six months of the war, the Japanese had carved out an empire in the Far East and Pacific which put even Adolf Hitler's conquests to shame. They believed that its extent would deter the Americans from a campaign of reconquest. In September 1940, over a year before the Japanese went to war, the architect of their Pacific Drive, Admiral Isoruku Yamamoto, had given the Emperor Hirohito a grave warning. If I am told to fight regardless of the consequences, I shall run wild for the first six months or a year, but I have utterly no confidence for the second or third year. Yamamoto was right. The Admiral knew the United States well. The consequences of attacking Pearl Harbor had been to waken the slumbering giant of American economic power. In 1937, the U.S. Army had been smaller than that of Portugal. But by 1944, the United States was producing nearly 50% of the world's armaments. The coming of war had unlocked a seemingly limitless potential. The weapons with which the United States supplied its allies were enough to equip 2,000 divisions. Yamamoto knew that the Japanese could not wage war on this scale. American industrial might was harnessed to the campaign in the vast expanses of the Pacific, where the most important capital ship was not the battleship, but the aircraft carrier. By 1943, the American frontline air strength in the Pacific had overhauled the Japanese. A year later, it was nearly three times greater. After the decisive American naval victory in the Great Carrier Battle of Midway in June 1942, the Japanese grip on their Pacific Empire began to weaken. By the autumn of 1943, its perimeters were being squeezed back into what the Japanese High Command considered a minimum defense area. Moreover, the majority of Japanese ground troops were bogged down in a seemingly unwinnable war in China. They could inflict grievous damage on their enemy, but like the German army in the Soviet Union, could not deliver a knockout blow. The problems of time and distance threatened to thwart the Japanese. As their Pacific defensive perimeter had shrunk, the great Japanese supply base at Rabaul in New Britain had been cut off by the advancing Americans. American bombers flew against Rabaul. 
the US amphibious forces made no attempt to capture Rabaul. It was isolated and left to wither on the vine. In November 1943, the Americans had landed on Tarawa, an island in the Marshalls Group in the Central Pacific, 1,000 miles to the northeast of Rabaul and at the extreme edge of the Japanese defensive perimeter. In the bitter battle for Tarawa, the Marines were to learn many vital lessons for the amphibious campaign which lay ahead. One of the key American targets was the Marianas chain, a springboard for air attacks on the Japanese home islands. By the autumn of 1943, the US Pacific Fleet had undergone a complete transformation. Its fast carrier task forces were built around the new Essex-class fleet carriers, heavily armed and embarking a hundred aircraft. The task forces and the amphibious operations they supported were sustained by massive fleet trains, a task for which the American war economy was superbly equipped. The strategy of island hopping across the Pacific was underpinned by a huge logistical effort. Much of it was channeled into the seizing and building of airstrips. Once completed, these airstrips were used to establish overlapping zones of air control, enabling the amphibious forces to bypass isolated Japanese garrisons. In the Pacific, air and sea power were complementary. In contrast, the Japanese Navy, in constant action since December 1941, had suffered heavy losses. Its carrier aircraft and their irreplaceable elite air crews were chewed up in a relentless war of attrition. The air bases within the defensive perimeter came under constant attack. American aircraft and submarines were fast sending the Japanese merchant fleet to the bottom. The supply of raw materials for which Japan had gone to war was drying up. In June 1944, the American landings on Saipan in the Marianas prompted a furious naval battle in the Philippine Sea. Nearly a thousand American carrier-borne aircraft were involved. The Japanese opposite numbers attacked in four waves, but only a handful in the second wave got near their targets. The rest, over 300 aircraft, were shot down. The Americans dubbed this phase of the battle the Great Marianas Turkey Shoot. It spelled the beginning of the end of the Japanese Imperial Navy. On Saipan, the Marines encountered fanatical resistance. The battle became a bitter struggle for every yard of ground. The Japanese garrison of 32,000 men perished almost to the last man. The island's civilian population chose to commit mass suicide rather than submit to the Americans. It was at this desperate point in the war that the Japanese launched the first balloon attack on the west coast of America. 200 were released not one of which crossed the American coastline. The Japanese went back to the drawing board with added urgency. By October 1944, they had developed an improved version, 33 feet in diameter and designed to fly at 32,000 feet.
With defeat staring them in the face, the Japanese made haste to launch a second wave of balloons against America. It was not until the end of October 1944 that the Japanese were ready to release the second wave of balloons on their ocean-spanning voyage to the United States. Each flock of balloons, made of heavy parchment paper stuck together with vegetable glue, was designed to reach a height at which it would be carried towards America by the prevailing winds at a speed of between 100 and 200 miles per hour. The balloons carried incendiary and anti-personnel bombs and up to 30 six-pound sandbags. These were released successively by a tripping device actuated by a barometer whenever the balloon dropped below 30,000 feet. Directly underneath the balloon was a large insulated box containing a battery and beside it a demolition charge designed to explode after all the bombs had been dropped. Underneath this installation were the aneroid barometers which tripped off the ballast release mechanism. Each batch of bomb carrying balloons was accompanied by one which transmitted radio signals enabling the Japanese to check on the progress of the flock across the Pacific. Because they wanted to be certain of their successful arrival in America, these transmitter balloons were made of rubberized silk. The bombs were released after the last ballast bag had been dropped. The Japanese theory being that by this time the balloons would be over the American continent. The demolition charge was then supposed to destroy the balloon, concealing from the American air defenses the nature of the threat flying from the other side of the Pacific. In theory at least, the incendiary bombs posed a real threat to the forest of the American Pacific seaboard. In Tokyo, Admiral Koiso and Admiral Yonai had taken control of the Japanese war cabinet. Drastic measures were adopted on the home front. Children were put to work in the war factories. Students were conscripted into the armed forces. At the end of October 1944, the Americans had landed in the Philippines, threatening to sever the links between the northern and southern halves of the Japanese Empire. The landings led to the biggest naval engagement in history, the Battle of Leyte Gulf. The Japanese planned to destroy the American invasion force by luring the covering US 3rd Fleet away from the beachhead. Their remaining aircraft carriers were to be the bait in the trap. It was a desperate gamble which saw the last battleship versus battleship engagements in naval history. The battle sucked in nearly 300 warships. Admiral Halsey, commanding the US 3rd Fleet, was drawn off by the Japanese decoy force, but he was saved by the intervention of Admiral Kincaid and the 7th Fleet. While Halsey's aircraft engaged the Japanese carriers, Kincaid dealt with the enemy's lurking battleships. The American dive and torpedo bombers destroyed the last vestiges of Japan's naval air capability. Four Japanese carriers and three battleships were sent to the bottom. Halsey had the last laugh. The landings at Leyte had gone in on the 20th of October. The Americans received a joyous welcome from the Filipinos. And General MacArthur was on hand to wade ashore and fulfill his promise made in March 1942 that I shall return. <laughs> 
Eleven days later, in Japan, the first batches in the second wave of balloons were launched. This time, the Japanese were confident that they would reach their targets. The Japanese estimated that the flight to the Western American seaboard would take four days. And it took precisely four days for the Americans to become aware of a new danger from Japan. American military intelligence was alerted that something strange was afoot in the Pacific. On the 4th of November, a naval patrol craft spotted what looked like a large fragment of tattered cloth floating on the surface of the sea. A sailor tried to drag the fabric on board, but inadvertently sent the payload to the bottom. But the salvaged envelope bore Japanese markings. An alert went out and the FBI was called in. Forest rangers were instructed to report any balloon landings and any portions of the balloons or their payloads which were recovered. The US Coast Guard service was placed on alert. But as yet, the true nature of the menace was not clear. Then, two weeks later, fragments of a balloon were found in Montana. And another envelope was fished from the sea. The Navy and the Coast Guards continued to watch the sky. For the next month, scientists and technicians sifted through the evidence to produce a rudimentary picture of the mystery Japanese weapon. Samples were sent to the Naval Research Laboratory in Washington, D.C. and to the California Institute of Technology. Analysis of the sand in several recovered ballast bags yielded clues as to where the balloons might have been made. It was not long before one of the balloons was spotted in the air as it floated over California. U.S. Army Air Force fighters were scrambled to intercept the intruder. One of the fighters shepherded the balloon into open country with the wash of its propeller. The balloon was persuaded to come to Earth. The automatic destruction device didn't work, and the entire assembly was recovered intact. Here was a veritable Heath Robinson weapon of war, ingeniously contrived and yet symptomatic of the desperate straits into which the Japanese had been driven. The envelope proved particularly intriguing. The heavy parchment with which it was built may have seemed primitive, but it was to prove surprisingly efficient and durable. In contrast, very few of the more sophisticated rubberized silk transmitter balloons crossed the American coast. At the bottom of the envelope was a single disc escape valve made of pressed steel and sealed with a rubber gasket. This was the business end of the balloon, designed to maintain altitude in the Pacific Passage and then release the payload over North America. The Americans were particularly concerned about the incendiary element of the balloon's payload. They felt that the balloon could not carry enough high explosive or deliver it accurately enough to pose a serious threat. But if, at the height of summer, thousands of incendiaries were to rain down on the west coast's tinder-dry forests, the effects would be catastrophic. 
The raging forest fires they would spark could not win the war for Japan, but they might have caused a commercial and environmental disaster. America needed the timber in those forests for its war industries. It was vital for the American government to take immediate steps to deal with a potential catastrophe, while at the same time taking every precaution not to alarm the public, which remained ignorant of the Japanese balloon offensive. The threat was taken extremely seriously, and at the very highest level. There were simply not enough civilian firefighters to cope with disaster on the scale the government feared. But ironically, the balloons could only reach America on winds which blew in winter, not during the summer months. Unaware of this, the government drafted in army units, many of them paratroops, to reinforce the firefighting forces. But the balloons posed an even more sinister threat. American military planners entertained a very real fear that they might be armed not with conventional bombs, but with chemical or bacteriological agents. These fears were grounded not in fantasy, but in grim historical fact. In the First World War, the gas shell had become a much feared feature of life in the trenches. Gas had caused at least a million casualties. In the 1930s, during the invasion of Ethiopia, the Italian Air Force had dropped gas bombs on defenseless civilians. As the Second World War approached, the fear of gas attack loomed large in the minds of the military and civilians alike. Training to deal with the threat was widespread and thorough. American planners were aware that the Japanese had not been afraid to use gas and chemical weapons in the long war they had been fighting in China since 1932. The Chinese armies and civilians had been subjected to attack by bacteriological agents. In 1942, nearly a hundred inhabitants of a town near Shanghai died from plague agents dropped by aircraft. This weapon had been developed at the Japanese Army's Camp 731, near Harbin. Here the Japanese conducted experiments of the greatest inhumanity on Chinese and Allied prisoners of war, including Americans. The commander of the camp was General Shiro Ishii, who fell into American hands at the end of the war. A number of Ishii's colleagues were captured by the Russians and placed on trial in Siberia for war crimes. The trial exposed the work carried out at Camp 731, including the spraying of plague-infected fleas from aircraft and the infecting of human guinea pigs with plague, gas gangrene and anthrax. The Russians wanted to get their hands on the driving force behind Camp 731, General Ishii, but the Americans were not prepared to play ball. Ishii had been granted immunity from prosecution on the condition that he helped the Americans with their own germ warfare program at Camp Dietrich in Maryland. In the new Cold War, Ishii's knowledge was judged too valuable to relinquish. At Camp Dietrich, Biological devices were exploded in giant spheres to record the survival and dispersal of bacterial agents. All of Ishii's blueprints for bacterial bombs were preserved and studied at Camp Dietrich. But the Americans were not alone in their experiments in bacteriological warfare. During the war, the British had conducted experiments with anthrax agents on the remote Scottish island of Grunard. 
they had well founded fears that the Germans were also developing biological weapons. After the war, the island remained off limits to cattle and to human beings for over 40 years. It was a reminder that in Britain's greatest crisis, Winston Churchill had considered anthrax as a weapon of last resort. In a memo to his chief of staff, Churchill dismissed moral objections to the project. In the end, Churchill was not faced with the last resort. But the bleached bones of the anthrax program's victims remained on Grunard as a grim reminder of the terrible decisions that have to be made in a total war. Both the Allies and the Germans had concluded that biological warfare was a two-edged weapon, capable of infecting not just the enemy population, but also friendly soldiers and civilians. The Japanese had not been so circumspect. In 1944, the Americans, who by now were only too familiar with Japanese ruthlessness, were understandably concerned that the balloons could carry a plague across the Pacific to the heartland of the United States. A crash program was launched to train decontamination squads and the authorities moved to impose a total publicity clampdown on the balloon campaign. The Japanese had bargained that the American press and radio would be unable to keep quiet, and there was also the need to inform farmers, teachers and schoolchildren in the areas most under threat. Surely the story would break in the newspapers. Incredibly, not a word leaked out. The Japanese high command concluded that the balloons could not be reaching America. In fact, of the 9,000 balloons launched against America, approximately 1,000 made landfall, appearing everywhere from Alaska to Mexico. Their only victims were five children and an adult who chanced on an intact gas bag, tampered with it, and set off the bombs. The balloon campaign was shut down in April 1945. A month earlier, the massive American air bases on the Marianas had begun launching B-29 super fortresses at the highly combustible cities of mainland Japan. It was the last round in the war of numbers which Japan was doomed to lose. The bombers did not have everything their own way. At 30,000 feet, they were buffeted like leaves in a gale by the same jet stream that had carried the balloons. Formations disintegrated, and bombing, often through cloud, became a matter of guesswork. The Americans were to achieve greater accuracy and devastating destruction by pulling the bombers down to 6,000 feet and drenching Japan's close-packed cities by night with incendiary bombs. The Japanese were being firebombed to defeat. The emergency services were overwhelmed. Fighter defences smashed aside. On the 13th of April alone, B-29s destroyed 11 square miles of Tokyo with over 2,000 tons of incendiaries. While the B-29s raised Japan's cities, American submarines were writing the last chapter in the history of the Japanese merchant fleet. During 1944, the submarines had sunk nearly three million tons of shipping. By the end of the year, so many Japanese ships had been sent to the bottom that submarines had to scour the seas for targets, preying on small coastal vessels. Japan's supplies of food and raw materials had been choked off. Those who stayed in the cities ravaged by bombing were reduced to a near-starvation diet. They scratched among the rubble for weeds to sustain them. Just as a second wave of balloons was being launched, the Americans were confronted with another new and more terrifying weapon. 
the kamikaze. The balloons had been unguided missiles. Now Japan deployed missiles guided to their targets by humans who would die on impact. It was a measure of Japanese desperation and determination to resist against overwhelming odds to the very last. The original suicide unit of 23 pilots had been recruited in October 1944 by Admiral Onishi, commander of the first air fleet. The name Kamikaze derives from the so-called Divine Wind, the typhoon which in 1281 had destroyed a Mongol invasion fleet. Many of the Kamikaze pilots were inspired by the Bushido military tradition of self-sacrifice. Others, certain of death, wished to die gloriously in a hopeless cause. Onishi told them, you are already gods without earthly desires. There was, however, a more earthbound rationale behind the kamikazes. Their missions could be flown against the Pacific Fleet by inexperienced pilots in any kind of aircraft packed with high explosive. And the kamikazes were very hard to stop. The incoming aircraft had to be completely destroyed, not merely damaged by anti-aircraft fire. The frenzy of a kamikaze attack presented a spectacle at one and the same time terrible and strangely hypnotic as the suicide aircraft flew through the wall of fire put up by the American warships. By January 1945, when the Americans landed at Lingayen in the Philippines, the scale of the kamikaze attacks prompted a series of crushing airstrikes delivered against Japanese airfields on Luzon. But the full fury of the kamikazes was reserved for the American invasion fleet, which supported the landings on the island of Okinawa in April 1945. The Japanese plan for the defense of Okinawa, codenamed Heaven One, included sorties flown by nearly 5,000 aircraft based on Formosa. Shortage of fuel dictated that nearly half of these aircraft would be flying one-way missions. At Okinawa, the kamikazes attacked in dense waves. The carrier Wasp was badly hit by a kamikaze and her wooden decks instantly set ablaze. She was saved by rapid firefighting, a technique in which the Americans now excel. At Okinawa, for the sacrifice of nearly a thousand kamikazes, the Japanese sank 32 American ships, damaged dozens more, and killed 5,000 seamen. But the kamikazes could not stop the American landings. The sacrifice had been in vain. At Okinawa, some kamikaze pilots had flown the Oka, or Cherry Blossom suicide plane. This was a rocket-powered flying bomb launched from the belly of a bomber. The Oka-laden bomber presented an easy target for American fighters. And many were shot down before they could release the Cherry Blossom pilots on their death ride. By the spring of 1945, the Japanese Imperial Fleet had entered its death throes. Its battleships and carriers sent to the bottom by American air power. By then, the Imperial Navy had launched another kamikaze offensive, this time by submarine. 
At Pearl Harbor in 1941, Japanese midget submarines had played a minor role. Two of them were recovered by the Americans after the attack. Almost three years later, these submarines were to have less conventional successes. By late 1944, the Japanese Navy had developed its own suicide submarine, the Kaiten, or Heaven Shaker, a one-man craft based on the Type 23 Long Lance torpedo, a weapon which had wrought havoc on Allied warships earlier in the war. The Kaiten could be launched from a converted cruiser or from submarine motherships. The Kaiten was a sinister craft, and those that survive can still exert a powerful effect on the men trained to operate them. It was intended that the operator bail out from his Kaiten about 150 yards from impact. But once he had squeezed into the cramped interior and the hatch above his head was closed, the operator knew that there would be no happy homecoming. The Kaiten was part torpedo, part metal tube. There was no shortage of volunteers for Kaiten missions. Many of the volunteers were trainee naval aviators, for whom there were dwindling numbers of planes to fly. The Kaiten pilots were trained at a secret base on a remote island off the coast of Honshu. Selection for the task ahead was rigorous. Like the kamikaze pilots, the men who rode the kaiten wore the white hachimaki headcloth, copied from the samurai warriors of old. The first kaiten operations were aimed against enemy shipping at Ulithi Atoll and Palau. At Ulithi on the 20th of November 1944, one of the kaiten hit and sank the oiler Mississinewa. But Japanese news reports of the early Kaiten raids wildly exaggerated their success, claiming battleships and aircraft carriers sunk when in fact it was the Kaiten force which was taking losses. By the end of February 1945, the Japanese High Command concluded that Kaiten operations against heavily defended enemy anchorages were merely inviting the destruction of the mothership submarines. Reluctantly, they decided to attack the seaborne supply chain, sustaining the American troops fighting on Iwo Jima. These operations also ended in failure. The carrier submarines were picked off by air patrols and surface groups. The Kaiten's last major operation, in July 1944, led to their biggest success. The American destroyer Underhill blew up when it ploughed into one of the Kaiten launched by submarine I-53. The final Kaiten victim, a landing ship, was sunk on the 15th of August 1945, the day Japan surrendered. Kaiten operations had cost the Japanese Navy eight submarines and 900 officers and men for no appreciable gain. The Kaiten pilots who had been spared were left to contemplate their own survival and the defeat of the nation for which they had been prepared to commit suicide. Theirs had been a terrible and unavailing sacrifice. In July 1945, in the New Mexico desert, the final preparations were being made to test a weapon far deadlier than the Kaiten. An atomic bomb was being readied for a test detonation. 
In Germany, the Allies had already uncovered the remains of the German atomic program and had concluded that it lagged several years behind the Manhattan Project. The Germans were nowhere near producing an atomic bomb. But the ruins of Germany held a last twist in the atomic tale. Germany had been defeated, but had the Germans exported their own atomic knowledge to their Japanese allies? In the last weeks of the European war, even Adolf Hitler could see the writing on the wall. The Russians were at the gates of Berlin, readying themselves for one final offensive. Endgame was in sight. British codebreakers at Bletchley Park, 50 miles from London, now had a ringside seat at the fall of the Third Reich and could penetrate some of its last extraordinary secrets. Messages encoded on their Enigma machines by the German military and then transmitted in Morse code were being intercepted and read at Bletchley in real time. The code-breaking teams housed in Bletchley's sprawling, hutted and concrete encampment were following every move made by the doomed German high command. Of particular interest were the movements of certain German U-boats and the cargoes they carried. U-boats were sailing to the Indian Ocean to transfer high-priority cargoes to their Japanese counterparts. Alongside munitions and machinery were more sinister consignments. The Germans were handing over the fruits of their wartime scientific research. Not only into such fields as radar, but also into germ warfare. On the 25th of March, 1945, Three weeks before the Red Army opened its attack on Berlin, a large German mine-laying submarine set sail for Japan. On board were several Japanese officers. Stored in her mine shafts were a number of heavy lead boxes containing radioactive material derived from the German atomic program. One of the crew later claimed that the containers were labeled U-235. Uranium-235 is an element needed to trigger an atomic chain reaction. The war ended before the submarine could complete her journey. Her captain surrendered to an Allied destroyer and she sailed under escort to America. It seems likely that the radioactive cargo was destined to arm a dirty radiation bomb built by the Japanese. Mysteriously, the American authorities claimed that the submarine carried only uranium oxide, which emits no radiation and would not have required lead containers. The target for the dirty bomb, carried by an aircraft catapult launched from a specialized Japanese submarine, would have been a city on America's west coast. Had such a raid succeeded, it would have eclipsed the ill-fated balloon offensive. It was left to the Americans to deliver the first atomic bombs against Hiroshima and Nagasaki in August 1945. These attacks brought an end to the war in the Far East and Pacific. The two raids killed 105,000 people. In the following years, tens of thousands more were to die of radiation sickness. On the 15th of August, 1945, the Japanese signed the instrument of surrender aboard an American battleship in Tokyo Bay. General MacArthur declared, these proceedings are closed. Japan's secret weapons had posed the terrifying but unrealized threat of a biological warfare offensive against the United States. The very real and equally terrifying kamikaze attacks on American warships by conventional aircraft and manned rockets and the menace of a similar submarine offensive. But none of these weapons could stave off inevitable defeat. <laughs>